but that's for you and me. Yeah, that's that's just just for us. Hello, human beings. Uh, yeah, uh, Chris and I were talking about something that we are not going to talk about in the podcast because we thought we were talking in the podcast, but we were having a problem and we had to start again. Welcome to the GMS Magazine podcast. Uh, this is a podcast all about board games, role-playing games, and the people who make them, sometimes the people who play them. I am your co-host, Paco Garcia. This is Chris from Deus Ex Machina. And we were talking about, mm. and we'll start talking about, uh, the fact that at the time of this recording, uh, Gloomhaven launched mm -hmm. on Backerkit. We were talking about the fact that we were surprised that Backerkit got this one. And I made the guess that Backerkit gave a sweetheart deal to uh, Cephalopair that was so appealing that they decided to walk away from Kickstarter and GameFound. Yes. I imagine Kickstarter wasn't going to offer them a big deal. Gloomhaven, uh, sorry, uh, uh, GameFound probably did, but Battlefield gave them a deal they couldn't refuse. That being said, it launched uh, at the time of this recording about two hours ago. They're already at 2,500 backers, which is incredibly impressive. So they've already hit $600,000 in a span of about two hours, I'd say, at the time of this recording. And I'm saying that I think this is not going to hit the crescendo that they think that they're going to do. Um, Frosthaven had a 500,000 goal. It met it in 10 minutes. It obviously went off to become the, one of the most successful Kickstarter projects of all time. It raised $12 million. Uh, looking at right now with Gloomhaven, um, we'll see what happens by the end of this day, but I don't think they're going to reach that level. Uh, as it is, we're both commenting on, on, on the shock that they put $2 million as their goal. They're going to hit it, I imagine. But uh, I'm just surprised that the Gloomhaven 2nd Edition was four times more than Frosthaven, considering that Frosthaven was an entirely new game and Gloomhaven 2nd Edition is a 2nd Edition reprint. Uh, you know, but that is that is that is what they've done, and, and it's a bit surprising, but that's what they've done. You know, there, there are several things, and we were talking about this, but there are several things I am very curious about. The first thing is a why 2 million. I mean, that is an incredibly high amount of money to make a board game. So I wonder, I really genuinely and honestly cannot fathom the scale of production that they are considering and the level of production that they are considering. I haven't looked at the campaign, so I don't know what uh, this, this edition is going to, to come, but I wonder what is it that they need $2 million for? And I have no doubt that they do. Okay, this is not to say that they are being dis um, dishonest or anything at all. No, no, I say this without any kind of cynicism or malice. I just don't know, and I would love to know what they need uh, $2 million um, for. I'm guessing it is to prepare for a worldwide distribution, but other than that, I have no clue. Yeah, there's probably more to the package uh, than than they're letting on. So we'll see what happens. But that is that Gloomhaven launched. I and I will just mention back to my campaign. Um, up until today, I was the single number one trending game on Backerkit. Uh, but just today, Lore Masters deck also launched. They've already hit eighty-four thousand. It's a story engine. It's not. It's a. It's a. It's a very interesting. I, I actually haven't taken a look at it. It's not five E. It's a tabletop game, but it's not like five E well, directly related. They're at seven hundred thirty-three backers. They've already hit eighty-four thousand. Uh, they had a seventy-five thousand dollar goal. They've hit it. Um, you know, and so they're number two, and we're number three now. Uh, so we're at, least, we're at least in the top three. I was kind of hoping we'd be second place, but didn't realize this one game was going to launch here. Uh, this was done by Story Engine, and it's a fellow far. It's at 631,000, uh, 29 days left. It's going to be a very interesting thing to see. And, of course, obviously, if you look at the recent activity, it's all just talking about Gloomhaven, Gloomhaven, Gloomhaven. Um, but, yes, this is a very interesting thing to watch. Uh, I, wonder, I, um, I, I wonder one thing, and it's... Um... I don't know if it happens the same in Canada and well, North America in uh, usual, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, firstly, they have launched the campaign very close to the end of the month when people have a lot less money to spend. So that mm. that I am very, very curious about. Uh, secondly, it is also um, convention season. Now, I don't know you, but before, you know, over the three or four months before Spiel, I tighten my expenditure a lot so I can save money to take to Germany and spend all my money in, in Germany to buy games that would last me all year. Mm. So I wonder if that is also playing because Origins begins very soon. Uh, Gen Con begins 
in a couple of months' time. Yep. Uh, and it well, as I said, it's, it's convention season. I don't know if Comic Con is going to be soon as well, and people will want to go. So I don't know if if that is something else. And at least in Europe, July and August is a uh, holiday season. So again, we don't spend money, so we can go on holiday. So I wonder if those things is the yeah. things that have stopped this. Uh, uh, you know, Gloomhaven project from going ballistic. Well, the funny thing was, and this is something that um, I've looked at uh, in just in my own observations. Some of the most successful Kickstarters of all time, uh, they don't launch during July, August, and September. And we're pretty getting pretty close to July. So this mm. is a bit of a, a surprise, but they're only a month away from other big campaigns. Uh, my ultramodern. Um, when it launched originally launched, I think I, remember, I think it was Affinity that might have launched uh, at the same time as Frosthaven. And so Frosthaven ran its campaign around this time. I think it was about a month earlier, but it was around the same time. It was it was around May, it was about, about around late May or so. I have run two campaigns at this time, uh, now three. Uh, this one ran a little late. I, I wanted to launch it in May. Uh, and now here we are launching in June, but um, they say they say that the best time to launch a campaign is March. Uh, mm -hmm. The interesting thing is some of the biggest campaigns of all time didn't launch in March. Uh, for example, Awakened Realm seems to love launching around Christmas time, which is usually a death knell for a lot of other campaigns. But they have launched two or three big campaigns then. Nemesis launched in March. Um, but uh, and so I think some of their biggest projects have launched in there, but I've seen other ones, uh, a couple of other like Hellboy uh, and a few other big four or five million dollar Kickstarters, all generally launch around April May. I think I do believe the big Batman one that made a bunch of money came also came out early in, in the year. But it seems like most Kickstarters want to launch in that time period. Um, like for us with this Kickstarter, uh, which will be ending at the beginning of July, I imagine despite my partner's plan that we launch another kickstarter by the end of the year i don't think that's functionally going to happen just because i want to make sure that we're one of us is free to run the project and he's running this one as i'm writing and uh, considering the amount of work i'm going to have to do i'm pretty sure that we're probably not going to launch the next one until next march um if we launch one in march we can launch another one in september so that's kind of how things will work from then on but um yeah july uh, I, asked, I wanted this campaign over by July. I didn't want this campaign running through July and August. Gen July and August is generally not, not a good idea. You know, I wonder, though, if it comes a point when your company becomes so well-known, your projects become so big that it stops mattering when you launch the campaign. You know, um, for Awakened Realms, they have such a dedicated uh, fan base that I reckon that it doesn't really matter when they launch. They are always going to be wildly successful because they have this inherent trust from from people. So I, I wonder if there is some some of that element to to that company, specifically to Awaken Realm, because they always seem to be doing phenomenal, uh, which good for them. You know, that's 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 very good. So how is your campaign going? So why I, uh, I I funded I launched uh, a week from uh, Tuesday so the is it recording on Tuesdays which is when we usually record so I launched on the thirteenth of June the campaign ends July fourth thirteenth uh, uh, so, of thirtieth of May you mean oh, no no we launched thirteenth I believe you pardon. yeah thirteenth of June we launched June, okay. the June thirteenth of so it was just last week okay sorry and we had a goal of thirty thousand we hit thirty thousand this last week we're creeping very we're inching very slowly towards 35 and we'll talk about some of the issues that we had uh, about that and one of the things we talked about which is something we were talking about on the queue about what we wanted to discuss was something about some of the new scams now back when um i ran amethyst like when I, well the first uh, ultra modern campaign there was there was very few people there were one or two people that send me messages saying, hey, I can boost your campaign with these. I, 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 we have access to X number of super backers. And a few people have got some of my money, and I never really noticed anything. Uh, when Affinity came out, uh, once again, I did a lot of advertising myself, but halfway through it, I brought on Backer Kit, and they started their own uh, advertising campaign, and they gave me a bit of a surge, and that's one of the reasons why I managed to creep above 100K. With Amethyst, we had it entirely through them. 
Uh, Naramata, I got very little uh, of that. But with Amethyst was a bit interesting. The last one, Amethyst, which was last year, I started getting a lot of messages from people that were claiming that they could get get me over certain thresholds, if not outright guaranteed, I could get my campaign to certain values if I just give them the uh, you know my uh, give them uh, uh, some money. And uh, I discovered, and this is something that I discussed it with at length with a bunch of people, that this one site that was trying to get me to pay them had about a dozen duplicate sites. And so we, if you thought one was a scam, they would simply switch over to one of the other ones that were identical in every way. And so I ended up posting it about it on the uh, Gamma page saying, hey, just what you, if you know, we do believe that these are scams. I believe this is a scam. And because they have 12 duplicate sites ple pledging and guaranteeing the same thing. And once I called out the person that had emailed me, they turned incredibly hostile to the point of threatening to find a way to destroy my campaign, to basically make it blacklisted so it wouldn't show up. Like it was just like a lot of hollow threats. Uh, like they did not have the capacity to do it, but it was, it, it, but it turned, it, but basically after they couldn't win me over, it quickly turned to extortion or attempts at extortion. Uh, and of course, it didn't have an effect. But um, in Kickstarter, uh, that has allows private messaging, and among those private messaging, um, previous campaigns, I would get one or two emails saying, "Hey, I could do this for you. Here's my website. Here's my account. This is how much I charge." Then in with Amethyst, I got about a half a dozen, if not eight or nine. It, it jumped up considerably. Now it has gone to a new level, a new division, a new echelon of bullshittery. Um, now. Fiverr is involved. Now, Fiverr, for those people involved, is a website where you could pay for people's services. I know a few people that run off of Fiverr. So Fiverr is kind of like a one-shot Patreon. So instead of paying someone per month, you pay someone once, and they'll do a service for you. So that's what Fiverr is. It's a kind of a contracting uh, site. I don't know what the actual thing is. I, I can I can I can I can chip in there. Fiverr is a website that started a very long time ago, and the idea, which is why it's called Fiverr, is that you could offer services and people would file, would charge a Fiverr. So you wanted a logo, you would pay five dollars. You wanted an illustration, you would pay five dollars. That very soon became very obvious. That it was very abusive because uh, an awful lot of people from countries like India. Philippines, so on and so forth, were on that site because it was very, for them, $5 is a lot of money. And people were taking advantage of that. They soon changed yeah. the policy so you can have different tiers. So, for instance, you can offer indeed to make a logo for $5, but if they pay you $10, then they get commercial uh, license. And if they pay you $15 or $100 or whatever amount of money you want to charge, then you get more out of it. So the site still can get you some very good if some days somehow somewhat sometimes devious and dubious but it's a lot more honest and ethical than it used to be sorry yeah. that, that's that's uh, my chipping so yeah it's nice to say it, it's gotten uh work. i mean i i paid someone a fiver for a video uh way back in naramata but i haven't done it since but now there are uh probably hundreds of people that are posting that they can boost your channel's awareness. They, they'll help you with your campaign. And they have faces like poster childs and so forth. And, and, um, and they have top ratings. Some of them are even fiber picks. And I started seeing more of these. I started investigating. And then me and my partner looked into it. And then we decided uh, to, you know, let's wait on this. Let's not do this just at this point. Let's just not, uh, let's hold off. And see what happens. Um, and then I started to see more and more of these messages coming through of people claiming to help. Not only that, then they started commenting on the promotion. So they have people or likely bots uh, that find people who are advertising their Kickstarter and then they comment. They'll space like, you know, um, uh, with one here, um, I can see your campaign has yet to reach your target fund goal. Why, uh, why can't you try email list promotion? It's 
great English blasting of your promotion done by an expert on fiber. It's also one of the best and unique way to get active backers and supporters for your GoFundMe. I can refer you to someone on that platform if you don't mind. Now, this is just ridiculous English beyond the fact that there's everything I just said to you was a single was a single sentence. There was no punctuation. Uh, another one on that same thread said, what have you been in order to achieve your campaign goal successfully? <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> what have you what have you been in order to achieve your campaign goal? I thought I can see your campaign has yet to reach your target fund. That makes sense. Why can't, why can't you try the email list promotion blasting of your promotion done by an expert on Fiverr? I don't know what, I know what that person's trying to say. It just says it in a horrible fashion. But what have you been in order to achieve your campaign goal successfully? I don't understand what that actually means. Uh, the funny thing is that the other person, when they said, I can't, I can see that your campaign is yet to reach your funding, your target fund. I actually had by that point. Um, but I've also gotten messages from people. I got one from a guy named Alex who did the same. He, he had a different route. So instead of posting on messages like Kickstarter Game Hub, which is where this one was, this is just one. There were a couple of others. I got a private message from this guy named Alex. Now, whenever anyone sends me a message um, company-wise, and I don't know who they are, I immediately grab their image and I do a Google image, image search. Mm -hmm. I did that. I've caught people red-handed. Um, I know people that, that there, there have been people that that uh, there have been uh, people that, oh, I can't even begin to tell you. I, I had this one person just randomly, I was just doing my thing. I just get a text, random text from somebody. It was like, a, it was, and who was an underage girl. And I'm like, uh, okay, I'm not interested in talking, but I'm like, who like do I know each other like it, like I, I I have kids that buy novels off of me at these events so I thought maybe this was somebody that wanted to talk and they just started having conversations and so forth and I realized like oh my god this person isn't even trying very hard and and like they were from Vancouver and they wanted to talk and they sent me a photo and I'm like oh I'll search that and the photo was a picture of of, of a girl that had been kidnapped what yeah, it was a picture of a girl that had been kidnapped, and then she was found like this, like literally someone took this image of a girl that had been kidnapped and was uh, basically yeah it was, it was a horrible thing. I was just like, and I literally was just like, this is the most horrible thing. Like, why in the, in the world would you use a you know a picture a that I could search to the point that I ended up calling the police and I showed them that and they're like, that's horrible. And I and and the guy was like, how did you know? That that image had been used. I go. I do a Google image search, and the police officer had actually had no idea that that was something you could do. Um, and so I do Google image searches, and the number of times I've done Google image searches, um, I've seen a restaurant website post photos of their food, and I'm like, great. You know that picture is actually from from Korea, so it's obviously not your food. Um, but I've done that, especially with people uh, who send me p images on Instagram claiming, hey, I can do this, blah, 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 I can do this for you. And I'm like, great, are you this person and this person and this person? And sometimes I find the original person and say, hey, by the way, somebody's imitating you online, I've done that. <laughs> so when I, I, so I grabbed this guy's Alex's image and I found two other Facebook pages with his face on it. And I'm like, okay, I don't know which one of these is legit. Um, and because they were both all, uh, it just has two different sources. I, I couldn't actually get to their page. And so I don't know if this person was using these images in other, in other formats or his other posts. But he said he could do this much, this much, this much for me. But then he says, to show you my support, I've backed your campaign. And he showed me his $35 pledge. And then he said, to sh and, and he's just like, I can guarantee you'll fund, I'll guarantee you'll make this amount of money if you pursue one of these people. And he says, to show you what I feel, what I mean, I have bought my pledge. And he upped his pledge to $900. And I called him out on it. I said, dude, there is no economic model that, you, that, that, that anybody will ever say is, is good if you invest $800 in me because you know perfectly well that you would have to be able to get $8,000 from me for you to pull a profit margin. I would have to dump thousands of dollars in the people you are representing for that $800 pledge to be worthwhile. Now I know at I knew at that point that this guy was a scammer. 
And I know exactly how they do it because you you have to have an account for back of kid or Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. You need to have a credit card to pit, to pledge. You don't, however, need a valid credit card. And that is something people do. They back your campaign to a certain value. And then they say, well, in this guy's case, you know, if, if, if you don't want to communicate, I can take my business elsewhere. And I would call the guy and was like, dude, I know exactly what you're doing. You, you're, you didn't put in a valid credit card, which means I know that once the campaign funds, you'll never be able to get the money. Your credit card will come up as invalid, mm. right? And as it stands, I mean, I, 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 my previous campaign, uh, previous, previous for Affinity, I had about four people that had bunged up credit cards, right? And well, actually, I had, I had way more than that. But everybody else fixed their credit cards in time, but three or four people never did. And now with Amethyst, I have one person who has a credit card that's invalid, and they have, they've never fixed it. And so a lot of people do that. Not only that, but sometimes p- friends will ask friends to back their campaign with a expired credit card, get that a value up, and you never have to worry about your friend losing money because it, it just all it does is bounce off of that invalid credit card. So you could have someone invest two or three thousand dollars into your Kickstarter campaign, but you'll never see that money. And that was one of the reasons, not necessarily, but bad credit cards is one of the reasons why Kickstarter did not, uh, Amethyst did not make nearly as much money as some people think because of all the number of fraudulent credit cards mm-hmm. that, that got punched in. So I called this guy on his bullshit. And so uh, earlier this morning or late last night, he canceled that pledge. But and 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 then someone was just like, "Oh, you lost your pledge." I go, "No, no, no. There was that was never money. Never I was gonna get. Exactly. That money was never going to be there." So I think a lot of people need to understand like that, that. Now we have this new scam route of using Fiverr to get people to pay. And sometimes, you know, sometimes like it starts as cheap as five dollars or can go up as much as a hundred dollars. But it doesn't matter if you spend the five or a hundred. If you put any money to these Fiverr campaigns, uh, you're you've you've thrown that money away. Like you, you do the do the advertising yourself, or use a reputable campaign. And I like what Backer Kit does because Backer Kit, um, because they make money off of the pledges. Like I don't know why Kickstarter has never opened up their own advertising uh, branch because they're, it's in their best interest to make people come to their platforms and and pitch. So if they're advertising your campaign, it they're they can charge less because they're they know they're making money off you in the back end. And this is another reason why I think Backerkit dumped so much money in the uh, Gloomhaven campaign because at the end of the day they take a piece of Gloom of Gloomhaven's budget, so they could spend that much money. You know, um, one thing I would say to anyone who would get a message. If you get a message from somebody who says, back me, you know, um, come to my Fiverr service, that is a massive, massive red flag. Because um, one of the problems with Fiverr is that anybody can register and anybody can have shop within it. No reputable company would do that. A freelance might, but no reputable company would set up a Fiverr. You know, me as a freelance writer or illustrator, I could. But if what I'm trying to do is to, oh, I'm going to do this to these many thousands of people, I would not need Fiverr. If I really had that reach, I could create my own website, my own mailing list, and not need a site like Fiverr to process payments, which is what they use it for. So never, ever, ever trust this kind of service, even less if it comes from a site like Fiverr. Never throw money at it. It's just never going to be worth it. I cannot hear you. You're muted. One of the things I find is annoying about uh, Backerkit. So there's a couple of now, now that I've run campaigns with Backerkit, there are a few things that I find frustrating. Um, Kickstarter has a has a direct message private messaging service, mm-hmm. and uh, so you can message backers directly. Uh, you cannot do that with Backerkit. Backerkit will not let you co- uh, communicate directly with backers until the campaign funds. Uh, which is there's a positive and a negative. There's a big negative in the fact that 
you can't reach out to Pacific back. Uh, you can't reach out to backers if there's an issue. They have to reach out to you or make a comment and then have it do it publicly. That I find frustrating because a number of times there's been a lot of private messaging I've done with 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 CAC, uh, with the backers that have been confused. Now they have to do it publicly. They can't email you directly. I don't like that. Uh, not only that, you cannot send updates to Pacific pledges. What? I find that's very frustrating. That's ridiculous. Yeah, Kickstarter. I can send an update to to Pacific um, to Pacific people to Pacific uh, backer pledge levels. So when I wanted to reach out to people who had uh, who were retailers that backed the retail level, I could send an update that only reached the retail of backers course. of all my Kickstarter projects. You cannot do that with backer kit. That's ridiculous. And not only that, but I have for retailers, I wanted to let them know that the we, you can now purchase things off of the add-on page for the retailer pledge. I have no way of reaching out to them. That's ridiculous. Uh, that doesn't make yeah. any sense at all. I mean, so what happens, as you said, what happens if you have somebody, you know, a pledge level that requests that requires specific information, like a name or a yeah. picture that you want to make an illustration to get in your book? How do you get in touch with those people? Yeah, and unfortunately, that means you have to wait until the campaign funds. It's a very frustrating aspect, or the person has to make their the comment public so people to read. Uh, by the way, as we've been talking, uh, Gloomhaven has crossed seven hundred thousand. Um, so the, the, so the thing about that, I find that a little frustrating and, and because there's no direct messaging that it's really difficult. Also, the other thing about back kit is that there is no way to add shipping prices to the campaign. Shipping prices will only be charged at the pledge manager. This is different, of course, from Kickstarter where you can add it, but of course it's inaccurate because once again, you really don't know how much these shipping prices are going to cost until your pledge manager launches. So Backerkit made the decision that there'll be there would be no um, uh, shipping costs incorporated. Now this is positive and negative. Yes, most of the time we have to make wild guesses of what shipping is during the campaign, mm -hmm. but in that same capacity, it that is a way of generating more revenue. So right now, you know, with my Physical backers, uh, 400 backers, let's say five, five let's say half of them are um, are physical, probably quarter, close to a quarter are physical. I don't get the revenue for their uh, shipping prices because shipping costs are incorporated into the campaign. So if you have $100,000 and you have a pledge that's $100, but shipping is $20, you're making $120 off of that pledge, and that goes towards your total, which means if we could add in shipping costs to our backer kit campaign, we would be several thousand dollars higher than we are right now. Now, that means we're going to make all that money on the post campaign, but it doesn't always look great if you're inching a lot slower than you actually are. And I was wondering to think about Affinity. The reason why Affinity launched so fast is because everyone bought the three-pack book and then everyone paid for shipping. So the average pledge was like $150 and we went up very, very, very fast. So that's that's one thing to, to be aware of. Um, so, and the fact that now I look at Kickstarter and they have made improvements. Like, here's the thing about Kickstarter I do like. I'm oh, sorry, Backerkit I do like. I like the fact that they, that their story have tabs down the side. So you can click on a tab. It'll jump you right to a certain section. Mm -hmm. Kickstarter as that as currently doesn't do that. When you back it, you're, you're taken to a new screen, which shows you all the pledges and everything. You can add images to those pledges. So you can actually see the images there instead of just a list of things. I like that. I like the fact that you can then jump directly to an add-on page and now the add-ons are listed. These are really neat things that they're doing. Their community is a lot more dynamic in the fact that you can comment, you can delete, you can do all that stuff. The only issue is Kickstarter has started to do this now. So now you can add images to your pledges on the sidebar. You can have more curation over your comment page. So Kickstarter is starting to see the competition from GamePound and Backerkit and finally incorporating some of these ideas. So um, most certainly this will be the, the only time we'd ever do, use Backerkit for this. We'll be, we'll be going back to, there's even been talk about rerunning Ultramodern like after this campaign finishes because it has funded, uh, re, uh, relaunching the exact same campaign on Kickstarter just for those people who didn't want to back this campaign when it was on backer kit. So can, can you we'll do see that what happens. Can you do that though? Because Kickstarter well, is look, quite keen, because it's quite um, final about not uh, crowdfunding uh, projects that you have crowdfunded elsewhere already. 
Well, that's what the thing is, the fact that, A, there's no problem without trying. Um, but two, I don't know whether or not anyone in Kickstarter bothers to check whether or not this campaign is exactly the same as other ones. The fact that BackerKit allows you to run a campaign that's identical to previous ones. It, at the end of the day, uh, if Kickstarter said, well, if we're going to get money from you, we don't really don't care where the source is from. Uh, but I will say the next two, uh, the next campaign, we will definitely be going back to Kickstarter. Um, while I like the cut of uh, Bagger Kids Jib, it's really easy to uh, build in the campaign page was super, 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 super easy. It was very easy. Um, and so, and I like the fact that once again, because it's all incorporated when BackerKit imports everything, it happens very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll see what happens in, in the post campaign once we start seeing the, um, the money come in and we'll see the process and seeing whether or not that'll work out in our favor. But I'm pretty sure that we probably will not be going back to um, BackerKit for our campaign. It was a nice experiment, but I don't think we're going to be going back to it. No, that is that's that's fair enough, and I have to say I'm not surprised at the results that you're getting, regardless of uh, you know uh, Frosthaven or Gloomhaven being there or not. But I'm not I'm not surprised. I don't I don't think that Backer Kit is gathering the momentum, um, enough momentum. You know, other platforms have have tried. Uh, you know that I am very very keen and a big fan of uh, game on tabletop. Which yeah, is still, I, I still think is the best flat, uh, crowdfunding platform uh, there is of all the ones I have tried, and I've tried uh, Kickstarter, Verkami, Ulule, Indiegogo, and uh, Game on Tabletop. Game on Tabletop is miles ahead from anything else, both in yeah. the way that you handle the project and everything. The only thing that lets them down is that they are not very well known. They are not getting the momentum they deserve, and the payment system is is a bit messy compared with uh, with other uh, other companies because you have to set up a Stripe uh, account so you can get uh, payments and PayPal, but you can only do the collect the money at the end of the pledge if you use PayPal, but not if you use Stripe, which is it's a pain in the ass. But um, it's, it's it's the best platform as far as I'm concerned um, by yeah. a mile. And- yeah, exactly. So, and the thing is, the whole point of us launching on Backkit originally was to do a reprint of Ultramodern without any additional content. So we weren't going to be uh, obliged to put out a lot of stuff. But they basically really pushed us to create something new. So we offered the adventures, which is a little frustrating because now we do have a workload in front of us. Now was the whole point. And now the moment, and it was a conversation we had with them. At the moment, we we're offering new content. Why didn't we just simply go back to Kickstarter? And it was a conversation, and we decided to go for it. And I think it was it was an experiment, but ultimately, uh, I don't think it worked. And uh, we will be probably going back to it. the other thing that popped up during the development is reaching out to um, YouTube creators to uh, or uh, and, or social media people, and there are a bunch. There are, of course, I th- always think there are three tiers. You have the people that just have a couple thousand mm-hmm. uh, backers. You have the ones that are at the 20, 30, 40,000, and then you have the very few that are in the high 100,000 plus. Mm-hmm. Um, we talked a few weeks ago during the um, uh, Aquacalope uh, fiasco about the fact that we were shocked at how much he was charging for coverage. Yes. Now, uh, the issue. Well, well, one question Has anybody called it the Quackagate? I don't know, but I wish they did. Well, the, the, really we, we just did. That's a quicker gate. Yeah. Okay, sorry. They're down to they're down to forty three thousand subscribers, by the way. So during this this whole thing, cost them about seven thousand subscribers. Uh, I haven't been back to the page because I don't subscribe to them. I just wanted to c- catch up there. Um, and there hasn't been other than that one initial uh, statement video that we watched at the same time. Um, that there hasn't been any other further comments on that. So still waiting on that front, but. We have been reaching out, and there are a few people that I reliably reach out to to do coverage videos. Um, some of them I've grandfathered in because they don't do that stuff anymore, but they do it for me because uh, I've worked with them in the past and we have a good relationship. So there's a few people I kind of always refer to. When I was doing Naramata, um, the prices for these game previews were, I would say, not impossible, but I, I was limited to my budget, but they weren't impossible. Right, like I'm not gonna lie, but to have a third party person on Rado, so not Rado himself, but have one of the other people do it, was well, $800. Mm-hmm. Now that's uh, it's a bit of change, but 
it wasn't completely impossible. The issue that stopped me most of the time was the timetable, not the money. Uh, Game Boy Geek, who did do coverage on Nerimata, I think was $300 or $400. And I know that some of the prices I've been seeing from uh, Dice Tower and other people that are similar, the highest price I saw was $1,500. And this was for very large channels. Um, and that was about three years ago. When we started approaching uh, the d and pages, uh, I was floored by what they were offering and how much they were offering it uh, okay. for. Um, one, for example, said a single 60-second spot and a blast on social media was just under $2,000. Ouch. We're a 60 second spot and social media coverage, not even a full preview video like uh, what uh, like the, the gaming gang does for me. He does like a, he'll do a full 30 minute coverage video and that will cost me about $400. And on that will also get the advertising banners on the gaming uh, on the gaming gang's website. Right. So well, who, who, Sorry, but I need to ask, but who asked you for 2000 for 60 seconds? Uh, so let's see if I can find the information. One second. Um, uh, let's see here. Let's see here. Let's see. Uh, okay, so here's one. Um, Bob World Builder. So Bob World Builder is a D and D or a gaming guy. Uh, he has a hundred and forty eight thousand, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob World. Yeah, Bob World Builder. He is currently at uh, one hundred forty eight thousand subscribers. Uh, and he says, my typical sponsor spot consists of a, of a 30 to 60 second overview of a product's main highlights and what excites me about it during the first half of the video. Mentioning links up to the product that are included in the pin comment and video description. I also showed the video on Twitter, Facebook page, Discord. The current rate for this promotion is $1,500 to $2,000. Um, I usually give a range to accommodate different budgets and the difference, and the difference affects the duration of the ad spot. Um, I told the person who sent me that, um, that no, that is criminal. And we need, and the thing is, and that's not the only one. We have seen others, uh, DM dad, I think got back to us as well. What was his, um, dungeon dad said $2,800 for a tweet and a 10 second ad. What the fuck? Sorry, but I mean, I, I, you know that I am all up for people charging for their work, but nearly three thousand dollars for one tweet and a thirty for, second that for a ten second ten ad, second ad. at the at the end of a video at the end so, where people no the, one watches anymore exactly when people aren't watching anymore. Um, holy shit. Sorry, I I get really upset about these things because this yeah this was actually upsetting me because these are these are guys that basically going well this is what I think other people are charging therefore we're going to make this statement across the board and it's ridiculous and I almost want to call these up and going you realize that you're you've clocked yourself out to just support the big name companies because there are no no campaigns, no YouTube, no no Kickstarter campaign. Ninety nine percent of Kickstarter campaigns revolving around uh, tabletop gaming well, don't even have don't have the budget for one of those, let alone several. And the thing is, what I'm trying to say to people, and this is where I get really angry. You have to have a potential of return. And what they say generally is that if you want to raise one hundred thousand dollars on Kickstarter, be prepared to spend ten thousand dollars in advertising. It's it's ten percent, mm -hmm. so you have to factor that into your goal. And the things we are about that we're about three thousand dollars invested and thirty three thousand dollars in and in, in raised uh, campaign revenue. So we're we are trending. And when I look at how much affinity and all that stuff that it did, yeah, we're looking at twenty. We're looking at ten to twenty twenty ten to twelve thousand dollars for some of these advertising campaigns. All in, I think affinity had the best return. It was about eight thousand dollars total for the hundred and twenty thousand dollar return. But these guys, if they're saying that a dungeon ad, a ten sec, a tweet, and a ten second ad is twenty eight hundred dollars. That means telling me that Dungeon Dads is practically guaranteeing that one tweet from them will raise you thirty thousand dollars, which is and impossible. That is complete bullshit. 
complete and absolute bullshit to for someone to believe. Thing is, I see the idea of Rado, Life Tower, when they make a preview video, we're looking at a 10 to 15 minute, sometimes longer video that you can put on your Kickstarter page as part of the video section that gets people to see your game in progress. But a 60 second ad does none of that. It is simply a promotional thing. And to have that, and to say that at $2,800, I don't even get a... And the funny thing that blows my mind, Dungeon Dad doesn't even have 100K subscribers. He's at 96, right? I have, like I said, uh, the Gaming Goat, um, which, uh, no, not the Gaming Goat, that's an asshole. The mm -hmm. Gaming Gang. <laughs> uh, he's at 10K. So you're telling me that between 10K and 94,000, that the rate change, and, and the fact that we get advertising, that he'll create a video that's 20 minutes long for $500 and also give me banners. And you're saying that the moment you go from 10K to 90K, it goes from 400 to $2,000 and you won't even give me a full length video. All I get is an ad and a tweet. That's ridiculous. No, Why that's are these people smoking. You know, I, 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 as I said, you want to charge for your content. Cool. My choice is not to charge for mine. Fine. Either way. But if you're going to charge for your content, at least give some quality content. One tweet and 10 seconds is not good quality. It's complete and utter bullshit. That is taking advantage of the numbers that you have to try and convince people that the 30 seconds that you're going to work on those people are worth nearly three thousand dollars i'm yeah. sorry that is complete and utter bullshit two thousand so two thousand people follow up on twitter that's not even close that for someone like this he should be in the same bracket as gaming gang 400 to 500 dollars i would have considered that at two thousand dollars, that is insanity. And if it was one person, I would have gone. That's an aberration. But I got it from two different people. And I have a guy, my uh, partner, who's been researching this. He says that's been the trend. They are asking for fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars for basically nothing. Nothing. And the funny thing is, in comparison, um, uh, Frederick Wheeler, who's a fantastic human being that runs How to RPG, which used to be called How to D and D. He has about 50K. He does not charge me for his content. Right? Uh, he absolutely can, but he doesn't. And I, I find him, a, he's, a, he's a wonderful person. Um, he's from New Zealand, so I don't hold that against him. I joke. <laughs> my, brother, my brother lives in New Zealand. That's why it's funny. Um, but it's surprising that anybody, the moment they, they hit over the 100K, suddenly they're charging. And they're doing this because they think they can score that kind of mm. money from the big crowd. What they're doing is they're doing the Las Vegas whale thing. They do, are, are not in any way interested in charging $500 to support the 500 type, uh, the, the, the 200 um, low level projects that can afford that. They want the whales. They want the $2,000 customers from Pathfinder, from all the big companies because they know those companies have that type of budget. So like Lord of the Rings role-playing game will, will pay us $2,000 for a tweet. Fine, fine. And then somebody comes, hi, I, I am a quarter of the size. I'm not even, I'm a tenth the size of this company. And they're like, yeah, so we charge $2,000 for them. We'll charge $2,000 for you. And so, and the funny thing is, whenever they say the word, a sliding scale based off of your budget, mm -hmm. as someone has dealt with people that have said that, it is a joke. I talked with one person, and they're sliding like they and they were they wanted fifteen hundred dollars for a commission, and I said that was beyond the capacity of my budget. And he said, "Well, we do a sliding scale based off of that." And I go, "Well, okay, so this is how much that we this is our entire budget." And he's like, "Okay, well, given that, I could reduce my my cost from fifteen hundred dollars to thirteen hundred dollars." I go, "That does not make a damn bit of difference." I have one guy. Uh, who was an artist that I really wanted to work with. He was a really nice guy. And he, had, he was charging $900 for our commission. I said, great, that's awesome, but I can't really afford that. He goes, well, we could do a sliding scale. I could drop it to eight to eight fifty. I'm like, that's, <laughs> that's not a sliding scale. You think, you think $850 is, you think $50 is going to make it different? I mean, I'm dealing with artists that are charging me 500 bucks 
tops. So and and their quality is absolutely astounding. I mean, you you can't give me, you know, sixty percent, forty percent more quality, or I say one hundred percent more quality. Go from five hundred to a thousand. I can't. You're not. You're not double the quality of this other person. And so it's 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 getting frustrating when I'm seeing these people. And the funny thing is, is that we're seeing similar things in the market. I know a lot of people are saying, "Well, the economy is tight." I go, "Yeah, the economy is tight." This is uh, when this is this is a, this is when Gordon Ramsay uh, was on uh, he does this kitchen nightmares. Mm -hmm. He says the biggest problem with restaurants that will go out of, that go out of business when they're losing money, their answer is you got to raise prices. Every single business, so because these restaurant owners will talk to a business analyst, a financial advisor, and they'll say the exact same thing. But financial advisors don't run businesses. They're not entrepreneurs. They don't understand the psychology of, of human beings. They don't have to because that's, they're, they're just financial advisors. So financial advisors say, raise the prices by 10%. That'll, that'll clear you in. They don't realize the fact that when you raise your prices 10%, nobody shows up. Hmm. And then you don't make any money. And when Gordon, so Gordon Ramsay you know, despite what people think of him as a person, when it comes to the fact that he has he has had restaurants fail, but he's also had a half a dozen restaurants that are currently running. And he has said, and he says the fact that if your restaurant's going, is losing business, lower prices. And people are like, that seems counterproductive. I go, yeah, but you're trying to encourage people to get in the door. If you reduce your prices by 10%, then you could increase. They go, well, yeah, but and they think, yeah, but we'll lose, we'll lose even more money. But he's like, you're going out of business. So you're going to go out of business in three months or in two months. You're raising prices. You're going to go out of business in one because you're not going to have anybody. And so that's what I look at the situation. If you want to make money and you have 100,000 subs and you want to generate more income and the economy is rough, if you reduced your pricing, like so if Dungeon Dad was just like, we're running a deal right now because we want to encourage more sponsorship we're dropping our prices to 500 they would have had my money but at two thousand dollars they don't have my money and there's a lot of people where two thousand dollars is not part of their budget which means they're they're banking that there are enough people that will pay them that will generate that income and i can guarantee you that there is not that many people that can afford that okay the, the one thing though i i understand the concept of raising the prices so they have to deal with fewer customers okay uh if you have five if you have these um um these adverts at 500 then you need four customers to get two thousand dollars and you have yeah. to deal with four people's expectations. You have to do four times of work. If you ask for $2,000, then you only have to have one to do it. However, I get that. And so I get that they want to work less so to make more money. And if they get four customers at 2000 then that's it. That's the month done without an issue and so on and so forth. But the thing is, if you really want to raise your prices that much, then the value that you have to offer needs to match that amount of money. This is why, you know, going back to the uh, restaurant um, metaphor, uh, Michelin star restaurants do that well, and they are so, so expensive because what they offer cannot be obtained by just anyone. A 60 second ad, a 10 second ad, a tweet, anyone can do it. Anyone will do it. So reaching numbers, unfortunately, doesn't necessarily translate into conversion numbers. Yeah. This is not how it used to be anymore. It used to be that if you sent 10,000 emails, you would get a 0.8 or a 0.9% return on those emails. So the more emails you send, the better the return. It mm -hmm. does not work like that anymore. The percentages are way, way smaller now. So, you know, this is something that we should keep an eye on. Let's take a look at how many followers this Gloomhaven project had and how many people actually backed? What has been the conversion rate for something that was really, really successful? So here, so here's and, something and, that's really and we should do it at the end of the campaign, by the way. And let's keep in mind. Sorry, let me let me just finish that my train of thought. Otherwise, I will I will completely lose it. And let's not forget that not everybody who's going to back these projects are going to be followers. So pretty followers of the project. Uh, 
So um, that I suppose that is uh, an exact figure that only cephalophyte could could provide. But please make no mistake. A large number of followers does not mean a conversion for one particular reason. You can buy subscribers to your channel. Yeah. You yeah. can buy followers in Twitter. They are not necessarily, they are not necessarily true ever. Yeah. So don't, don't trust it. And you can also, just in case, you can also buy viewers, views to your YouTube channel. You can pay a thousand dollars and get 10,000 views on your videos. So yeah. please, please, I beg you, as a YouTuber who doesn't want to be big and has no interest in being big, trust me on this one. Those figures are not trustworthy ever. Yeah. So right now, Gloomhaven has 82,000 followers, and right now, 3,000 people have back. That means when you get to a, te to a technicality, they're running at about a 3.76 conversion rate. So 3.76% of their followers have backed. Assuming, sure assuming that only followers have backed. Assuming yeah. that, which is a huge assumption to make, which yeah. I'm probably untrue. Now, I don't know their actual stats, so I'm making the guess. I do know my stats. My conversion rate is 3.3%. Now, that's where my conversion rate is. Now, let's take a look at the end of my campaigns on Kickstarter, and because I can tell you right then and there what my conversion rate is, and you'll see a pattern. Uh, and I, like I said, conversion rates jack up in the last few days. So you'll see really, really low conversion rates at the beginning. So right now, 3.3 is actually... Uh, very much on the low side for my mm -hmm. conversion rate. Um, but I do, you always get low conversion rates anyway uh, at midpoint. You'll see this is this increase. So if I go in and look up these pages here, this should be able to open up. Um, the, my conversion rate from the people who followed compared to the people who converted is 21% for the amethyst from last year. So 21% of people who followed back. With Affinity, it is 26%. And with Ultramodern, it was 28%. Are you seeing a pattern with mm. this number? All three of them had a big, basically, a, there were only a few. They were all in the mid 20s. So, one of the biggest things I'm looking at now for this one is seeing whether or not I maintain that number. Now, right now, it was a 3%, but I'll tell you that I during the campaign, mm -hmm. my conversion rate was usually as low as. 8 to 13 percent so when the campaign runs it's going to be very very low so i'm going to be i'm going to be taking a very close look at my conversion rate for this game when my campaign ends and if it's lower than 25 percent then i know that backer key can bring people but it's not converting people to the extent i like uh, and that's one of the biggest reasons why I may end up going back. Well, I will be going back to Kickstarter because I can't see my conversion rate jumping into the 20% from 3% in the last three days. So that's one thing to heavily consider. Uh, and so, yeah, that conversion rate is kind of important. So, yeah, back on can can maybe bring people. But right now, their conversion rate is is not very good. Like right now, it's sitting at 3% both for Gloomhaven and me. And a 3% conversion rate. Uh, like I said, uh, if I was newbie, maybe I thought, oh, that's normal. But as someone who, where this is my sixth campaign, I can tell for, I can say for a fact that that number is not very good. If I go into my other project, if I go into Naramata, what's Naramata's uh, conversion rate here? Let's see if I can bring it up. Because uh, Naramata, I think, Naramata had a 7% conversion rate. So that, was, that one was, that one had an issue, but that was also a campaign that didn't do very well. And it was my first board game. But when it comes to my tabletop, my D&D stuff, 20% across the board. Um, so yeah, so Naramata had a very, very low conversion rate. So that was, that's was, that, was, that was us learning the hard way of the problem we were going to have with that game. And that's why that game didn't very particularly uh, do very well. But what I said, when I look at my other campaigns, they all did very well, the high conversion rate. So it'd be very interesting to see what Gloomhaven's conversion rate is at the end of this, because I'm still sitting at 3%. And if I don't clear 10 or 15% by the end of my campaign, that'll tell me that um, we're not converting people visiting 
I think there's a lot of people that are coming to back to kids page and going, nope, this is too unfamiliar. This is, I don't know what this is. This doesn't look like Kickstarter. I, I reckon there's uh, there's going to be an awful lot of that, and I don't know if Backerkit is doing or it's going to do, you know, to actually take uh, Kickstarter's mantle, which is a real shame because it's about time somebody did, but it ain't happening. So best of luck with that, and um, we'll see. So, so that was my those are my two big topics. Uh, obviously, we have the news to go through. Do you have anything else you want to add before we go on to the news? Well, no, I wanted to go through through the news already because I'm really looking forward to talking about this um, renegade the tongue. Well, like I said, we've had there were there were two things that have happened in in, in the last week. The other big piece of news, uh, which I know that uh, I don't have my champagne near here, uh, but the other piece of good mm. news. Yeah, I know what you you're going to say. Yeah. Is, is that new, t- new TSR has filed for bankruptcy. <laughs> I'm so happy. This I'm is, very happy. This is, this is a unwoke go broke. This is uh, fuck around and find out. This is, oh my God, the consequences of my actions. Basically, the top three comments to every TikTok video, this is basically what's happened to new TSR. Now, this is them basically trying to prevent themselves from having to go to court. They're trying to use the the loss of the uh, the bankruptcy to prevent themselves from having to go to court and to stop um, this attempt. Uh, but this will this will spell doom to the new TSR brand. This will probably spell doom to their museum. They've been uh, pretty tight lipped on everything. But this is because because Wizard of the Coast is not backing down. They have they either have to settle and they do not have the money to settle. They take it to court and they're going to get their ass kicked. So now they're trying the only other tactic they have, which is declare the fact that they have no money to give them. And if you have bankruptcy, it's very hard for creditors to go after you once you process your bankruptcy. And so regardless of what happens to the lawsuit, if you're bankrupt, there's no money to give you. The thing is, though, um, they are actually trying to sell their games by getting rid of their TSR logo and changing it with an OSR kind of logo, which... I don't know in U.S. law, but I would reckon that within European law, that cannot possibly all that legal. Yeah, like I said, it's it's going to be a very interesting thing uh, to um, to follow. Uh, but that was obviously one of um, two pieces of news. The other one, which was more recent, Renegade Game Studios mm. issues cease and desist to indie creator over the use of the word renegade. A uh, small gaming company, the Polyhedral Knights, is closing in on their end of a Kickstarter campaign for their seventh game, Renegade City. Um, they received a cease and desist from Renegade Game Studios saying they have to change their name or else. Uh, this is beyond ludicrous. If um, if Renegade uh, if Renegade City decided to say, nope, we will refuse, we'll see you in court. Uh, this is a strong arm tactic because Renegade Game Studios has to know that if this went to trial, they would lose. Um, I, don't, I don't understand what they are trying to achieve, uh, to be honest with you, because I I just cannot see, firstly, why? I mean, we are talking about a project that has finished with 61 backers, 3697 dollars. Seriously, it cannot possibly be worth it on the basis of people are going to look at Renegade City and think it is anything to do with Renegade Game Studios. Even if they did, 61 people, what were you thinking? It is ludicrous. But what is more ludicrous still is that Polyhedral Knights, and this they could be getting into trouble with, assuming the Rockstar Games decided to take issue with it, is that they have gone for the Grand Theft Auto uh, video game look and feel. Now, that is foolish. Now, the funny thing is we've seen very... um, There have been a couple games that have come out that have tried to mimic that. Um, they never go after them because they know it's kind of foolish and they exactly. know they're not losing and they also know they're not losing any money. There is no way anyone's going to confuse Renegade City 
with Renegade Game Studios. One's a company, the other one's a game. Uh, this is beyond ludicrous, and I really hope that um, Polyhedral Knights uh, stands firm because if they wilt, um, because this is something else where um, uh, I have a game that was run by a friend of mine, a game made about a million dollars called Stars of Acarios. That mm -hmm. game uh, had to change its name because uh, it was too similar to another game, and they decided it was just easier for them to change their name. And I think the name is better i think the old name was just too simplistic which is the reason why there was there were you know there were issues um so yeah suffice to say renegade city first of all it's like i really really hope that they they fight it um but well, a, a, a small company like polyhedral knights probably i cannot i don't imagine why they would even have to fight it i reckon this is if it ever gets to court because uh, sending a cease and desist doesn't mean that they're going to take legal action. A cease and desist letter is just a threat. It's the yeah, threat it's of, the hey, threat. If, you, if you don't stop, then we will take you to court. This doesn't yeah. mean that they're going to take them to court at all. It just means that they're being dicks. But yeah, if, and like, and like you, and like, yeah. if they and went to City. court, if they went to court, I cannot imagine any court on earth who would not look at this and think, case dismissed. Fuck yeah. off. <laughs> now, the funny thing is, is that, um, yeah, yeah, Renegade City, yeah, the font looks like Grand Theft Auto. It had a goal, it's, it, like you said, 61 backers. They're getting so much more attention now because of this. Yeah. Which I think is hilarious. Um, and the, the, the only issue, uh, I'm going to confirm this. Is that um, they're partners with Hasbro, mm -hmm. and Hasbro has a, a deep pocket, so they could simply say, "Why we'll see you in court. Prepare to spend a shit ton of money on 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 this." Unless you have a lawyer who's talented, who's willing to work pro bono, um, you uh, know, we'll do, simply we'll, we'll simply tie you up in, but in, I know, in the courts. But would but you need? Like, would you need a uh, clever lawyer? I mean, would you need a clever lawyer when it's a matter of saying to the to the judge, "Look, Renegade Game Studios, Renegade City. Uh, how do you mistake these two? And any judge with any sense will say, uh, "Yeah, don't waste my time. Go, go, yeah. go, go away. Pay, pay for everything. Bye." <laughs> well, electronic electronic guards love suing people. They can sue them and say, "Hey, we have a game called Con Command and Conquer Renegade." That's too similar to us. You're going to have to change that name as well. It's like, are you saying the fact that that any instance of the word renegade, does that mean you own the word renegade? I mean, this is, this is one of those situations where, and it, it, like, if someone came up to me and said, you know, someone's playing a lawsuit, cease and desist because your, your, your game title Amethyst is too similar to our game on title Amethyst, I'd be like, well, I can show you the historical background of this, so I will see you in court. Um, and the funny thing is, is that, I was just talking about, and we'll, we'll talk about it this time. We'll talk about it last time about the tribalism. Uh oh, going on you're in trouble. What? Look, there is a company called Ultra Modern IT Services. They could sue you. There is another company called Ultra Modern Engineering Limited. They could sue you. Ultra Modern That's... Media LLP, Ultra Modern Development Group, Ultra Modern Pool Patio. Yeah. Did you see and how it? it, it yeah. <laughs> It's, it's bullshit. But the funny thing is, is that once again, we're in a situation where I'm like, wait a second, ultra modern is a, is a part of our lexicon. It's <laughs> exactly. like, it's, not, it's, it's one of those situations where uh, I have a game called the source book and now I'm copywriting it. So no one can call source book. I, I, I copyright the word sci-fi, you know, it's one of those situations where we were talking about the fact that, that the most that, that Wizards of the Coast could copyright when in regards to Magic the Gathering, that, that they copyrighted the idea of rotating a card and then calling it tapping. They couldn't copyright the actual mechanic, but they've copyrighted the term tapping in reference to that game mechanic. And they, can, so, and they the, cannot copyright the word tapping either. You could create another mechanic and call it tapping and they wouldn't be able to say anything about it. You could have a game about... Um, tapping people making, in the shoulder and each let each card is a shoulder. I was, I was, no, no, I was gonna say, <laughs> that you can have a game about the making of beer and you have to tap kegs. And so the act of tapping kegs, you're like, wait a second. 
he's like we, we own the term tapping like you don't own the term tapping you ever tapping a beer a beer stein is, has been in the lexicon of beer making for about a couple hundred years more before your company was even born but remember that we have seen companies get incredibly litig litigious for the most dumbest Litigious things reason, possible. Yes. We have seen major companies go to war over the use of a term because they're trying to enforce it. There is no greater example than Nintendo. Mm -hmm. Nintendo sues everybody, including their own fans, for no reason whatsoever. I mean, and because, no. and this is a very, I hate to say this, but this is very much a thing out of Japan. Companies in Japan are so paranoid about their property that they are very, very, very trigger happy when it comes to lawsuits. And yet, Canadian companies, American companies don't do it as much, but it's, me, it's, it's, it's huge. In Japan. Talking about Nintendo, though, and this is something I don't understand. You say that there is a fella here in Spain who released mm -hmm. a Pokemon game ah. with Pokemon images, as in literally lifted from the Pokemon websites and the Pokemon comic books. You know, from the from from all the manga and everything. Yeah, I mentioned that to Nintendo, and they have done absolutely sweet FA about it. Nothing. Yeah, it, it depends. It depends on whether or not they look at it and go, "Is this worthwhile?" I, I mean, when the Aliens um, Predator video game came out, they went after all of the homebrew third-party video game conversions: the Doom Alien, the Quake Alien. Uh, these were very very popular. They never bought the, these games. Some of these games were out for years, and um, um, 20th Century Fox never bothered to curtail them until they they put out their own game. So it's and it, 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 if you can prove without a shadow of a doubt that there is no like they they've not done anything, it's one of the reasons why there's such a problem with with uh, copyright infringement with these conventions in regards to using copyrighted imagery. Marvel. Uh, Hasbro, they don't go after these people, these conventions, because there's they're not taking any money from the company. It's advertising. The company doesn't sell them. It's advertising, but it's also not worth it to them to spend the money on the lawyers to send that kind of action because there's absolutely no, there's no, there's no positive consequence. And, and yet, is, and yet, we are talking about the company that sends the Pinkerton after a few missed cards. So yeah, mm. and 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 that damaged their reputation because there are people. Remember you because because the issue is, and this is what we talked about, is that there are people who know psychology, and then there are the financial people that have no concept and no grasp of reality. So you have somebody who says, "Oh, we got to brag these back for them and hide the Pinkertons," and then somebody who deals with the customer interactions, who does know the psychology of public. Bangs his head against the table and goes, did "Why any, the did hell anybody, did you called, do that? Did, did anybody call the guy?" <laughs> it's, like, any... <laughs> you, it's like there was a there was an issue that happened where uh, there was this adult forum. It was a it was an adult forum. There was a lot of like uh, AR, you know, like role playing and so forth. But it was an adult. It was a porn a uh, forum, but it was all consent consensual and so forth. And they they got into a big thread talking about the new uh, new Nintendo, and there was this massive thread talking about how much they're loving it, how much they can't wait for it, and so forth. And then Nintendo sent a cease and desist because they didn't want to be associated with this adult site. So they went and, and so they sent a cease and desist to the company that was running the running the forum to take down the post. And then the forum was just like, "Why are you doing that? These are you, these are your fans talking about how much they love your game, and now." This somebody made the decision to bring the hell or high water of all Nintendo's weight on top of this small website to because they didn't want to be associated with it. Of course, this is the whole Streisand effect. It blew up. Everybody mm. knew it, and and Nintendo was just like, and then so, so Nintendo had to go in and they went on the site and publicly apologized, and they offered everyone in the thread free free Wii's because they realized how incredibly stupid they were because. And the thing is, the fact that that was an old Nintendo, new Nintendo was more than open to do it. So this is just incredibly stupid. And the funny thing is, this is a week after the Ravensburger upper, um, the mm. Ravensburger upper deck fiasco, where they're trying to copyright game mechanics. 
I, th I think it's the sea sink. There's something in the water because this doesn't make any sense at all. This, the, I, 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 don't. I, I, I just don't get it. But I, I'm really disappointed because, uh, you know, I, I thought of running. I thought very highly of Renegade Game Studios. I thought they were good people making I have, games. So. I've had a couple of games with them. So I don't. I don't get it. I am really, really, really disappointed. And and I hope they do the right thing and, you know, go to this renegade city and say, you know, we're sorry, we made a mistake. How about we buy your game and make something really super cool out of it and, yeah. and, and get it sorted. But other, other than that, yeah, sorry, renegade, you've been idiots. Yeah. And it's, it's because like I said, at the end of the day, I can't see anything good coming out of this. Like there's no. like there's nothing nothing really it's what else it's just it just it just looks bad on them. Yeah. It's it's uh, I think it's backfired quite quite badly. And I've only seen in Facebook in my feed two people saying, Oh, understandably the sea and the cease and deceased, uh, but they all thought that it was to do with uh the dress code of the, the you know the um the old look and feel of yeah. uh, Grand Theft Auto, and then they realize, that, oh no, no, this is absolutely nothing to do. This uh, season, this is has nothing to do with it. So, so there you go. So um, that's it. I don't have anything else for today. Yeah, uh, like for me, that that was that was big. I said uh, that as we as we conclude this, uh, we are seconds away from crossing eight hundred thousand dollars. So we are now uh, like three hours since the launch of the campaign. This is, like I said, in any other perspective, this is a huge success. But it's be very interesting to see how long it takes for them to get to two million. They're definitely not going to get to two million. I don't think they're going to get to two million in a day. I don't think they're going to get they're mm. going to get funded in a day. We'll see what happens. They're definitely not didn't get an hour. They didn't get ten minutes. Um, so this campaign is ne definitely not raising the type of money at the rate that Frosthaven did, and maybe they weren't expecting to. But at a two million dollar goal, they probably were expecting it would. Well, I I wish them the best. To be honest, uh, I hope they make it. I hope they make a huge amount of money, and I hope that uh, people back in that project also back yours because why not? Uh, yeah, it, exactly. would be, it would be very nice. You, know, you can back one project back too. Come on, people, do that. My guess, my guess is this time tomorrow I'll look at it. They, I will say one point two, one point three million by this time tomorrow. If it's less than that, I'll be really shocked. I'm worried. Oh yeah, that would be yeah. that, that 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 would worry me. I would be worried if I was set the Cephalo Fair and I was and I was not at least a 1.5 within the first 24 hours. I'd be worried. Well, we'll see. We can talk about that tomorrow. Uh, and by the way, we haven't spoken about this uh, secret thing that we said last week that we were going to talk about this week. But I reckon that because you haven't mentioned anything, uh, we cannot talk about that yet. What's that? We cannot talk about it. Okay, we won't talk about it. Now, remember Next last week. week we said, oh, this has happened. You know, these people, they have done this. Uh, you know, and they have done this to this person. Right. Can you remember now? No. Yeah. I've had a busy week. Okay. Uh, when, well, when, we, when we recorded last week, my campaign had just launched. So I was very much like. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to, you know, uh, but I will. Uh, I will. We stop recording, I would tell you, and then you can say, Oh, of course. I bet. So, anyway, humans, uh, thank you very much indeed for being there. It is uh muchly appreciated as usual. Um get in touch, please. Love to hear from you uh in the video comments. That would be brilliant to hear from you. That would be really great. And on podcast at gmsmagazine.com. You can email us anytime you like. Uh, Twitter at GMS Magazine and Facebook at GMS Magazine as well. That that would be me. This is Chris from DSX Machina. Find me on all social media channels under DSX Machina. And at the time of this recording, uh, my my campaign as 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 is sitting at around thirty three thousand. Uh, we have four hundred eleven backers. We're still the number three part of the backer kit, and we are still going to be running uh, at least until uh, I do believe the fourth of July. The fourth of July. We're I think I think we're closing on fourth of July. Closing with a bang, quite literally. Yep. Good. I like that. 